Stalin had betrayed the Communist Party by going nationalist and making a non-aggression treaty with Hitler. And Stalin had thought the British and the French would conquer Germany soon enough after the war was declared. But the Allies didn't move and the phony war ensued. And Stalin was most surprised when the Germans invaded Russia with their Barbarossa because Stalin knew that Hitler wasn't that stupid. In April of 1944, the German architect of the non-aggression pact with Stalin, Joachim von Ribbentrop, who was the ambassador to Britain, would be seen as he, quote, met with two British officials in a seacoast town in the Pyrenees, close quote, to find out the conditions of a separate peace with Germany, which evolved into Operation Sunrise. Von Rippentrop had been born in Wiesel, where his father was an important army officer, and as a boy, von Rippentrop had learned both French and English, and when he was 16 years old, his family had moved to Arosa, Switzerland, and Hitler especially liked Sunrise for having the same code name as his near victory in the Beer Hall Putsch. It was to Arosa that Hassel, the fired ambassador to Rome, had gone in February of 1940 to meet with the anti-Hitler conspirators, and at that time, von, Tri Rip von Rippentrop was 46 years old and had been the ambassador to Britain for almost four years. Von Rippentrop had earned the Iron Cross during the Great War, and he served as a staff officer in Turkey in 1918, where he'd gotten to know Van, von Papen. And in 1939, Hitler appointed von Papen as the ambassador to Turkey. Von Ribbentrop was one of Hitler's closest and dearest friends because von Ribbentrop would travel frequently to England and return with assurances that Britain wanted to make an alliance with Germany. And von Ribbentrop's hook with the British was that he believed in a restoration of the German monarchy as an intrinsic part of the Nazi plan. Von Papen was a hardcore aristocrat, and von Rippentrop had been drawn to him for that reason. And in the spring of 1914, von Papen had been running guns to Huerta during the Mexican Revolution, and then he became the German military attaché to the U.S. And when von Papen began talking to the American OSS in the fall of 1943, FDR got wind of it and ordered the OSS to stop making contact with von Papen. Sunrise continued anyway, and von Rippentrop would be at Hitler's birthday party in the Fuhrer bunker in April of 1945. And that day, Alan Dulles received a telegram from Truman ordering a full stop to Sunrise. Von Ribbentrop returned to the Fuhrer bunker three days later but was refused admittance, and he would be arrested by the British near Hamburg on the 14th of June and sent to Nuremberg for trial, and he would be the first to be hanged. Von Ribbentrop loved Hitler to his dying day, and his last words were, I wish peace to the world, and many of these side plots between British spies and proselytizing Nazis had simply been an attempt by the British to keep their greatest fear at bay, and that was an alliance between Germany and Russia, while the great fear for every American statesman and the reason FDR strove for friendship with Uncle Joe had been the nightmare of an alliance between Germany and Britain. The Valkyrie conspirators involved in the 20th of July plot had asked Donovan's OSS for assistance, but FDR refused to allow any Americans to get mixed up with the Valkyrie group because they were anti-Russia, and it would have been a near thing if the OSS had managed to remove FDR. Stalin had gone to Jesuit boarding school and he hated it, and in winning Stalin over as an ally, FDR convinced him to rehabilitate churches anyway. Lenin had made 
peace with Germany by ceding most of Russia's good land and working factories. And during the Great War, Russians had thought the German Tsarina Alexandra was sending secret messages from the Winter Palace to Germany over the new wireless transmitter, and so Lenin moved his capital to Moscow from St. Petersburg to distance the new government farther from Germany. Rasputin had gotten Alexandra's only son to stop bleeding from his hemophilia, and Alexandra kept Rasputin close to her in case the boy had another episode. And Rasputin worked with the Tsarina to build roads to improve food distribution along with other public works projects, making many jealous to the point of hatred because his work deprived them of the opportunity. These officials had been keeping their positions by doing nothing and making sure that nothing got done, precisely because that would make it glaringly obvious that they were needed. Most of all, Rasputin was hated for helping Jews after he had a law passed allowing Jews into high school for the first time in Russian history. The nobility believed that peasants and Jews were ordained to suffer by heavenly law, and when Russia was forced to retreat from Warsaw in the fall of 1915 as the Germans were marching in, the Russian army punished all Jews they could find on their way out of Poland, believing them to be not only on the side of the Germans, but also acting as spies. When the Russian soldiers came home early from the trenches, they killed all their landlords who had caused the war, and everyone starved because the managers were killed right alongside the landlords, and then the Red soldiers came through, confiscating grain and livestock for the war effort against the whites, and the civil war that raged after the Russian Revolution dragged on year after year because the British White Army had invaded the motherland and were determined to put an end to Lenin's communists who had withdrawn from the Great War. Many of the original Soviet leaders just happened to be Jewish, although it was really more like 80%. And after gathering all the food they could from the Russian peasants, the Red Army also took their seed grain and their breeding stock, so the peasants mixed dirt in with their seeds to keep the Red Army from taking all of it, but the soldiers carried away the seed grain too. More people died of starvation in Russia in the 20s than would be killed by Hitler in combat in the 40s. And few books were written about Russia that accurately told what the revolution was like because most books were written, published, and printed by people who'd lost money when the Reds took over. However, a genre of Russian revolutionary novels emerged under Stalin that remain some of the best thought opera reading ever, if you can find it. The Russians tried the same thing as in Germany, putting people into work camps after confiscating their assets, but it didn't work in Russia because everyone was so poor that the government could barely break even just trying to feed them. When prisoners would fall down dead on the march to the gulag comp camps, the guards would arrest some new people along the way just to make the numbers right, and after seizing all the estates from the upper classes in Russia, the revolutionaries were surprised to find out that rich people didn't actually have much wealth to confiscate after all. When Napoleon had marched into Russia for the Battle of Borodino in 1812, over 80,000 soldiers had been killed, captured, or wounded in one day, more French than Russians. And when Napoleon had gotten to Moscow one week later, the town burned down around him, and then it started to snow. Half a million French had marched into Russia before winter had gotten underway, and the following spring only 50,000 French were left alive, and Napoleon had taken his army into Russia to convince the Tsar to stop doing business with Britain. The fourth attempt to stop Napoleon in 1806 had seen a coalition of Russia, Prussia, Saxony, and Sweden allied with Britain, and the motive for the British was to kick the French out of Hanover, so Britain had blockaded all the ports along the entire Atlantic coast of Europe from Brest on the western side of France up to the Elbe River 60 miles south of Denmark. Napoleon issued his Berlin Decree, 
forbidding all Frenchmen from doing any business with England, and he arrested English sailors found in any port in Europe, seizing their cargo for France. And Napoleon had hoped the Berlin Decree would bring Bitten Britain back to the treaty table, but the result was a doubling down of the French sacred tradition of smuggling goods and engaging in unsupervised trade. Prussia found out that Napoleon was going to give Hanover to Britain, so Prussia declared war on France in the fall of 1806, and Napoleon marched towards the east to face the Prussians and rolled right over them, reaching Berlin within three weeks and Napoleon marched another 300 miles to Kaliningrad and beat the Russian army at Friedland on the 14th of June in 1807, and the Tsar sued for peace. This fourth coalition ended with the Treaty of Tilsit that saw Russia joining in the continental system of Napoleon's government, and at this point, revolutionary France was at the height of its power. Britain would collect a fifth coalition in 1809, made up mostly of Austrians, who lost again to Napoleon's well-trained Grand Army, and as a result, Austria lost Salzburg and Trieste to the French, and Napoleon was allowed to marry the Austrian Emperor's daughter, Marie Louise, who was 18 years old, and when Wit, who was 18 years old when Napoleon had reached the age of 40. By the Fifth Coalition, there were too many foreigners conscripted into the Grand Army for it to be the cohesive fighting force it had once been, and the Peninsular War was draining the French. So when Britain went for a Sixth Coalition in 1813, they were operating under the assumption that the Germans were chafing under French rule and would rise up against Napoleon, but that's what they thought during the Fifth Coalition. Not only had the Germans refrained from rising up to interfere with Napoleon's crusade, but the British were supposed to have landed in the Scheldt to help Austria during the Fifth Coalition, but they'd been too late because by then the Austrians had been defeated in Bavaria, and when the British arrived in Holland, 4,000 British soldiers were immediately felled by swamp disease. Britain's Sixth Coalition convinced Russia, Prussia, Austria, Sweden, Portugal, Spain, Sicily, Sardinia, and some German states to fight Napoleon and his few remaining allies, and the French were finally defeated at the Battle of the Nations from the 16th to the 19th of October in 1813, after which the French retreated back towards their homeland. Napoleon abdicated on the 4th or the 6th of April, and he signed a first surrender on the 11th and the 13th of April in 1814, and Napoleon was sent to the island of Elba on the 30th of May, but he escaped and came back for another round, so the Seventh Coalition finally forced him to quit for good, and Napoleon's last campaign was called the Hundred Days. The Congress of Vienna met from November of 1814 to June of 1815 so they could undo what Napoleon had done to the thrones of Europe, and the Congress of Vienna had been meeting for over four months when Napoleon escaped from Elba on the 26th of February in 1815, and Napoleon marched for 100 days until defeated one last time on the battlefield at Waterloo on the 18th of June, and then he abdicated on the 22nd of June and was banished to the island of St. Helena, where he would die six years later later in 1821 at the age of 51. The island of St. Helena was a British possession in the middle of the, of the Atlantic Ocean, 10 miles long and 6 miles wide, halfway between the African Congo and the jungles of Brazil. While the island of Elba had been an Italian paradise for Napoleon, where he was surrounded by his Sicilian relatives, and Elba was seven miles off the coast of the western top of Italy's boot and 100 miles across the water from the French Riviera. Hitler spent about as much time in prison as Napoleon had spent on the island of Elba and at the Congress of Vienna. Britain blamed America for not letting them make the King of England also the King of France. 
and they refused to sign the final agreement of the Congress of Vienna, claiming they had to fight Moorish pirates in the Mediterranean.